Um, be ready. Great. Okay, people are starting to join. So we'll just give everybody a minute. Um, welcome to those of you who are joining now. And um, yeah, we'll just give it a minute for everybody to join. Okay, uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. This meeting is being recorded, so um, if anyone is joining late, they can watch the recording, but we'll get started. Um, so welcome to the webinar, and thank you for joining. Um, today, we're going to be discussing our topic, the contending with the housing crisis, refugee resettlement, and we're ha we have a housing expert roundtable. Uh, so this is going to run for approximately 90 minutes for about an hour and a half. Um, and we're really excited to have everyone on the call. Um, and we're being, we're, this uh, webinar is being presented by Switchboard, part of IRC, and Refugee Housing Solutions, which is part of CWS. Okay, so my name is Joshua Weber. I'm the Associate Director of Training at the Refugee Housing Solutions, part of CWS. We have three great speakers today, uh, part of our panelists. A little bit later on, we're going to have each of them introduce themselves, but this is just a, a brief introduction. We have Chloe, Hannah, and Chuni joining us today, so we're really excited. Uh, the way it's going to work today is we're going to do a very brief introduction and kind of set the stage for today's discussion. Uh, we've got some polling questions to find out what you're most interested in discussing, uh, and then as quickly as possible, we're going to get to really the the uh, center of today's uh, webinar, which is the question and answer with our panelists. So um, that's really uh, most of what we're gonna get through today. Okay, a couple of quick uh, Zoom webinar tips. So please uh, read these and just make sure that you connect your phone or computer audio under audio settings. Uh, the chat is disabled due to large number of participants today. However, we are gonna open up the Q&A section so you will be able to actually post your question, but we'll get to that in a moment. Um, please, you know, click the hand icon to raise your hand, although we're not going to have anybody being able to ask their questions directly today. And then under the Q&A, you'll see a tab at the bottom. Uh, you can type a question or click the thumbs up icon to upvote your other another participant's question. So the idea with our Q&A is that someone can ask a question. As many of you who want to learn more about that can give it a thumbs up. And then that way, as we're going through the, the discussion today with the panelists, we can focus on those questions that a majority of you are interested in discussing. So I really encourage you, if you have a question, um, you know, to, to put that in and to give thumbs up to the questions that you find the most interesting or the most relevant to your work. Okay, so we have two main learning objectives today. Uh, th this is the aim of the webinar for, for um, uh, what we hope is the takeaway. The first is that uh, we can describe ways the U.S. housing crisis affects newcomers, including through rental housing shortages and rising costs, and that you'll be able to name promising practices from the field to help navigate these challenging uh, market conditions. So understand the issue and then hopefully come with some solutions. Okay, so all of you are on the webinar. Please, uh, we have a polling question for you. So the question we're posing are, are there enough affordable housing options available for refugees in your area? A, yes, there are ample affordable housing options. B, yes, but they are limited and often in high demand. C, no, there is a shortage of affordable housing for refugees. Or D, there is there are virtually no affordable housing options uh, available. Great. So I'll give you all a minute. I see a lot of you are already answering. This is very helpful for us to kind of um, understand how we can address these issues. Okay. 
Okay, great. Looks like 80% have uh, filled out the polling question, which is great. And unfortunately, which is not a surprise, those 62% of you is, are responding that no, there is a shortage of affordable housing uh, for refugees. So um, no surprises there. This is very much in line with our work, but uh, thank you for filling out the polling. Obviously, this is what we expected, but um, great. Okay, so um, we're going to move forward. All right, so the this is, uh, we're going to have a lot of time for discussion, but this is your opportunity now to go into the the Q&A tab and begin populating that with your questions. So um, we understand there's a lot of different people here from different organizations, you know, people, case managers, directors of affiliates. Um, this is your chance to ask your questions. Um, and then also those of you, like I mentioned earlier, go through and give a thumbs up to those that you support. And we're going to hopefully get to as many, if not all, um, today. Um, the second thing I'll mention just while we're on this slide is that um, we'll take note of those of you who are asking questions that we don't get to today, and we will reach out to you um, to help to see that you get the support that you need for any questions that are unanswered. So hopefully we get to as many as possible, but obviously there's a lot of people on the call, so sometimes it's just not possible. Okay, great. Okay, so uh, these net just very briefly, we have about four or five slides in which I'm just going to set the stage for today's discussion. So housing meets a, means a lot of different things to different people, uh, and we can't cover all the housing topics in today's webinar. But really, this is just a kind of like I said, uh, setting the stage so that we have some a starting point, some common ground for this Q&A session. So the topics for today's discussion are going to be rising housing work with different um, timeframes in which we're supporting refugees gain access to housing. So we're going to focus um, on different timeframes and different challenges that are being faced. Okay. Um, then focusing specifically on the rising cost of housing, uh, the high cost of securing permanent housing is partly due to the widening gap between federal direct assistance and the cost to secure and furnish housing, as well as which, which leads to high temporary housing expenses as there is no sustainable funding resource or sources for temporary housing. Uh, there are many barriers to accessing available housing for newcomers and refugees. Newcomers arrive in the US with no credit history, no rental history or income employment history, and all are typically required to rent in most places in the US. Landlords often discriminate against sources of income, not wanting to accept government assistance, and this is something that we hear more and more through our work, something we can talk about today if we have time. And then also just general housing instability beyond the 90 days after arrival. So limited housing assistance leaves clients and refugees newcomers to face housing insecurity and instability once that assistance ends. And newcomers are often one life event, losing a job, et cetera, away from a severe housing insecurity and instability. Okay, great. So we've kind of set the stage. We understand the general topics that we're going to talk about today. Um, we've got another polling question. This one, we're getting a little bit more um, into the specifics of what we'd like to kind of hear from you about where, where you're supporting refugees. So the polling, next polling question is, what is the most significant challenge to refugees in accessing housing during the resettlement process? A, high cost of living in your area. B, the lack of housing that accommodates larger household sizes of refugees. C, lack of documentation required to access rental housing. D, landlord hesitancy or discrimination in the housing market, renting to refugees. Or F, unrealistic refugee expectations on types of housing. Okay, everybody's answering. This is great. Um, we'll give it a minute.
Okay, we're at just about 80% um, of participants have responded, which is great. Thanks for the participation. We appreciate it. Um, and we're at 66% of you are saying the high cost of housing uh, is the most significant challenge. Um, then all of them being significant challenges, but high costs and lack of housing, obviously no surprises there. This is part of the you know, overall housing crisis in the U.S. in regard to affordable housing. Okay, great. So that thank you very much for that, um, for your participation. And then this is our final polling question. So this is uh, the third, and then we'll get right into the, the Q&A. Um, so let's see, polling question three. Okay, this is, like I said, final polling question, but we appreciate the participation. What is the impact of the refugee housing crisis on the local community? So specifically, there's no noticeable impact on the local community. There's some strain on resources, but it's manageable. C, significant strain on resources and social services. Or D, it's an overwhelming burden on resources affecting the community's well-being. So obviously, this is something that's very specific to different geographies. Um, but again, very interesting to hear what you all are seeing. Okay, we're at about 70% respond. Excellent, that's great, appreciate it. Um, and we're getting a slight majority of people saying significant strain on resources and social services. Okay, great. Um, thanks for the participation. Okay, so um, we can move on now. So this is, we can start the, the question and answer. I can see in the Q&A section, we've already got a lot of great questions. Um, so what we're gonna do now is I'm gonna hand it over and um, ask the panelists to give a brief introduction uh, of themselves. Uh, and then we're gonna come back to me and I've got already a bunch of questions that I'm ready to ask. So um, maybe I can just have Chloe first, a uh, brief introduction from Hyas. Great, thanks Joshua. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Chloe Shiras. I am the program manager for the initial resettlement team at Hyas uh, and my team oversees housing for our network. Uh, HIAS is one of the 10 national resettlement agencies, uh, and we are a network of 24 affiliate partners uh, in 17 different states. Um, so really happy to be here with you all today. Thank you. Okay, great. Welcome, Chloe. Um, and Hannah? Hi, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Everyone can you hear me? Okay, perfect. So, hi everyone, I'm Hannah Presser. I'm the Program Officer for Housing Technical Assistance at IRC, or International Rescue Committee. We are also one of the 10 resettlement agencies here in the U.S., and we have 28 offices across the U.S., so um, happy to be here today. Thanks for having us. Okay, great. Thanks. Welcome, Hannah. Uh, and Chuni from IRC. Hi, everyone. I'm Chung Yi Lu. I'm also from the IRC, like um, Hannah, and I'm a senior program officer for affordable housing solutions at the IRC um, headquarters. And it's nice um, to um, see everybody here. Thank you. Okay, great. Welcome, Chung Yi. Okay, so we can get into the questions. So I've got a lot of questions already in the chat. So what I'll do is I'll go through and I'll kind of find the ones that are being upvoted from the group as kind of the most relevant to their work. Um, and then I'll ask the question and I'll give each of the panelists an opportunity to respond. And we'll just kind of go through and, and see where the discussion takes us. So our first question is, with less availability of housing nationwide, many new arrivals must go into temporary housing before being placed into permanent housing. 
what are some of the impacts for newly arrived uh, refugees from being placed in temporary housing rather than being able to go immediately into permanent housing? So this question is about kind of that that lengthening of that temporary housing situation and what are the effects that that has on longer term re resettlement? So maybe I'll start with uh, hand this over to Chloe and then you know Hannah and Chuni, you can um, jump in after she's finished. Great, thank you. Um, so I think this is a, a very uh, common scenario for all of us that work in resettlement. And, you know, many times we think mostly about the financial implications of being placed in temporary housing. Um, but I wanted to just highlight a couple of the other impacts um, on uh, newly arrived refugees from temporary housing. So, you know, of course, by definition, refugees arriving to the U.S. have already endured displacements, potentially trauma. Um, and the uncertainty of being placed in temporary housing can be challenging for clients who are hoping to have stability in their lives as they arrive to a new place. Um, so there are, you know, mental health impacts that can result from this placement in temporary housing uh, upon arrival. Of course, it also is sometimes extremely necessary because as we just saw in the polls, um, you know, the lack of housing, lack of permanent housing is very difficult to come by specifically for this population. Um, but I just wanted to point out that, you know, it's important for us to think about how housing might play into clients' experiences as they first arrive in the United States. Um, being placed in temporary housing can also delay clients' integration into their community. Um, if they're placed in hotels without kitchens, um, you know, that means that uh, there's going to be a delay in navigating to the local grocery stores or getting children enrolled in school right away. Um, or meeting neighbors or finding the closest religious institution. Um, so I think later in, in the webinar, we'll have some time to talk through some of the ways that we can hopefully try to get um, into permanent housing more quickly. Um, but there are, you know, these some of these longer term integration impacts from um, being placed into temporary housing. And of course, as I'm sure you all know, it is also far more expensive and means that clients won't have as much of their per capita funds uh, to be spent on permanent housing. Uh, so those are just a couple of things to highlight. Okay, great. Yeah, thanks, Chloe. Uh, Chuni or Hannah, if you want to jump in. Um, I just, you know, echo everything Chloe already mentioned, um, and I want to point out that it is well documented um, in uh, academic research, the linkage between housing and health, um, and by health, I'm talking about both uh, mental health and physical health. Um, so, you know, just as Chloe mentioned already, um, housing insecurity and staying in temporary housing, you know, not having um, a kitchen, um, and, uh, you know, small space um, and the, the uncertainty of, you know, when um, people can be moved to uh, permanent housing, all these can have um, tremendous impact um, on um, clients' health. Um, so that's just, you know, what I wanted to add. Um, Hannah, would you like to add additional points? Yeah, I agree with everything that uh, Chuni and Chloe said as well. And, you know, we really believe that housing is at the core of service delivery. And so um, not being able to have a permanent address or permanent residence can really delay a lot of things, as, as Chloe and Chuni have already mentioned. And um, the studies, as Chuni mentioned, have been, you know, found that this does have an overall impact on overall well-being, and it is a struggle once you're sort of in that position to move forward. And so um, it is a big problem and something that we prioritize when we're um, considering where we're placing clients and how quickly we can get them into their permanent housing options. Okay, great. Thanks. Yeah, and we definitely see that in our work as well in that um, any delay moving from temporary to permanent housing, it basically kind of delays all of those norm normal integration kind of milestones for livelihood, you know, in education, and as Trini said, health, um, and it really does impact kind of all areas of um, the lives of refugees and newcomers. Um, okay, great. So uh, we're just going to keep moving. So next question. Um, we're looking towards an increase in arrivals in the next fiscal year. Um, and so what are some things that resettlement agencies can do to prepare to house a larger number of refugees next year? So 
I know that this is something all of us are working on um, at our respective resettlement agencies, but you know, maybe some ideas of um, actual kind of strategies or things that you can do to prepare knowing that um, there may be an increase in the next fiscal year. So we can start maybe with Chloe. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I think the, the main thing we would recommend here is really connections. So there's a lot of different connections that can be made and trying to think creatively about different outlets that maybe haven't been tapped so far in your area. Um, so connecting with property management companies at a higher level, um, inviting landlords to your quarterly consultation meeting so that they really have an understanding of the increase in numbers and just understanding refugee services more generally. Um, connecting with other agencies in your resettlement area, I think is really important. This can uh, lead to strength in numbers when uh, approaching different landlords in your community. Um, you also can coordinate on a number of different things. So if you have a client's travel that's canceled or you have a client that out migrates, you can work with other resettlement agencies in your area to coordinate to get another client into that unit to really maintain relationships uh, with landlords. Um, have you know the landlords that you do have on your roster that have been really supportive do outreach to new landlords holding events. So I think connection and really expanding the number of properties and landlords that you're working with is going to be really important as we look towards um, some more growth. Uh, we know that that is a heavy lift, but it's something um, to be thinking about now when you do have uh, maybe at some point smaller pauses and arrivals um, to be really thinking through how to build that network to make it, um, uh, uh, you know, prepared for the, for the next year. Yeah, thanks, Chloe. Um, Hannah? Yeah, I echo everything that that Chloe just said, um, and I will just say developing those landlord relationships are very crucial. Um, it's it's something that does take time to do, but it's worth it once you have those relationships developed. And if you have a landlord in your corner who will reach out, you know, maybe when they have a unit available or they know of another building that could possibly be an option for an incoming family, those are incredible resources to have at the local level. And then just to build upon what Chloe was saying, building your referral, your local Local referral system specifically and knowing what services are in your area nearby and you know knowing affordable housing organizations who can help provide additional services to clients um, having connections with HUD certified housing counselors who are you know your local experts for what's going on in your community um, these are all great resources to have uh, to help deal with impending arrivals. And, um, you know, the more the merrier. I think this is a whole community approach to housing and, and the more resources we can share and um, compile are, are really beneficial to everyone. Thanks, Hannah. And, and Chuni, maybe? Yeah, um, so I want to add that um, it, it's one thing is that's very important is to also kind of look at the you know big picture. What are your overall housing strategies in um, you know helping clients finding housing? Um, if if there are already strategies developed, um, review them and uh, see whether there are any updates necessary. And if you don't have, have overall strategies, um, look into developing um, an overall strategy. You know, what are the strategies and, and tools and the solutions for um, supply? What for housing supply, what are the tools and strategies for improving access? Um, the uh, supply and access, you know, are the two most, um, you know, the, the challenges we heard about the most. And what are the short term strategies that you can implement um, to target supply side and also access challenges and then what are the long term solutions? Um, long term solutions often of you know, of course, it takes a long time um, to see outcome, um, but it will be good to begin to plan on them um, because 
a long-term solution does require advanced planning and uh, a lot of um, steps in trying to implement them. So, you know, looking at both short-term, mid-term and long-term strategies to really um, develop um, housing strategies so that you are prepared um, for, you know, different arrival situation. And the other thing I'll suggest is also look at your arrival, estimated arrival numbers. And from that estimate how many housing units um, you will be, you know, you will be actually looking for clients and, and make plans related to, to it. And then implement, you know, everything Chloe, Hannah mentioned already, you know, building partnership, cultivating landlord relationship. Um, these are all very important in terms of improving, um, you know, improving access and also get more supply uh, for housing. Um, and uh, finally, you know, I think, one thing I want to mention is that just keep in mind that there is, you know, we oftentimes may be hoping that they, there is one solution that can fix all our housing issues, but in reality, we need all the tools and all the solutions we can get. Um, so really looking at housing, not just from one point of view, but looking um, at housing overall, looking at every aspect to um, develop, develop solutions that you can utilize. Okay, excellent. That was great, all three of you. Um, and the only thing I would add also, um, besides echoing all those points, is that um, one of the things that we've found is that a lot of uh, resettlement agencies are actually um, hiring housing focused staff or, you know, just either at the affiliate level at the national level. Um, and this is just to go kind of hand in hand with what Chuni was just saying that having a strategy and a plan, but then also understanding that the staff time needed to um, identify housing both temporary and long term is significantly harder than it was 5, 10, 15 years ago. And just to acknowledge that is kind of the reality, um, rather than expecting, um, you know, your case management staff to take on that housing search and, you know, to have a housing focused person and then a, a plan and a strategy anticipating that this housing crisis is is going to be something that's with us for a while, I think, um, is something to, that we can all do to prepare for the next fiscal year and those um, increasing demands. Okay, great. Okay, excellent. And um, Joshua, if I could just add one please. thing, I think, um, you know, I completely agree, Chuni, with um, kind of this need to be focusing on these these bigger solutions. And, and Joshua, to your point about the staff time, something that we've seen that really helps with that staff time is affiliate agencies themselves renting units that are then subleased to arrivals um, for temporary housing. Um, I think this is something that for an increased number of arrivals for your individual agency can be really helpful because it just gives you a cushion of a couple more weeks or you know a month even to be finding permanent housing options. So what we've seen several highest affiliates doing is again, renting units as the affiliates, furnishing them, and then you have temporary housing that is at market rate rather than, um, you know, the cost of an Airbnb or a hotel um, that clients can go into immediately upon arrival while you have more time to look for permanent housing. Um, so I'm happy to talk about that further if, if folks on the call are interested. Yeah, and if it's okay, I will also add that, you know, similar solutions um, have been implemented by a few IRC um, sites. Um, the, the one Chloe mentioned about leasing um, a, a, a property um, in preparation for arrival. And then the other strategy that often are implemented is actually really plan early and look into um, securing housing before clients arrive. Uh, arrive. So many IRC offices also, you know, focus on, on that. Um, and then um, just adding to the capacity, you know, uh, in reality, maybe maybe the, the overall supply is very difficult to increase in your location. But if there is um, point, you know, basic designated housing staff, you know, one or two, or, you know, one housing staff and intern to help or volunteer, um, it does definitely add to the capacity of working on, you know, more difficult and challenging housing solution um, um, situations. Um, so, you know, for example, if one person is spending all the time to, you know, talking to landlords, building relationship, the other person can help with logistics, you know, other logistic planning. So it definitely um, will, you know, improve the situation, even if your local housing supply 
won't change, you know, drastically in, within a very short term, but you can build up your staff capacity. Okay, great. Um, yeah, I totally agree. And also um, just that when we know we do a lot of technical assistance for uh, resettlement agencies that are having challenges, and oftentimes the ones that are having the most significant challenges are the ones who kind of didn't do any planning around uh, housing and staffing and that sort of thing. So we know it's going to be an issue. So kind of allocating the resources is something we find to be a solution. Okay, great. Um, all right. So there's a lot of excellent questions in the chat. Um, I'm trying to kind of put them in themes, but um, the next question I have here is, um, and this is more at the state and city level. So what resettlement agencies are seeing um, state and cities do? Uh, the question is, what are some promising practices that we've seen from state and city partners uh, to support resettlement in regard to housing? Um, so a little bit of a uh, different framing of the question, but I didn't know if um, maybe we can just start with Chloe. Is there anything that you see at the state or city level initiatives or um, things that are kind of supporting the resettlement process? Yeah, I mean, I think at the, the city level, one of the promising practices has been um, gathering with uh, city council and also local housing groups. Um, we're really at a time when we need to be stepping just, just stepping outside of just of our resettlement realm and really tapping on organizations that are focusing on housing, uh, government officials that are focusing on housing, um, and really kind of put pressure on local and city government to understand the housing crisis and the housing needs that um, the state and the cities have committed to for um, you know, welcoming refugees. Um, so I think, again, utilizing those quarterly consultations as an avenue to invite people to, but also um, researching and showing up those local um, city council meetings that are happening in your area um, has been a productive strategy. Um, we have also seen, again, um, local agencies coming together in numbers. I think that those strategies are much more uh, productive when it's all of the agencies coming together and making asks as, um, as a unit. Uh, so those are some of the things that I would, I would offer up. Yeah, and just to, to add on to that, um, some of the things that I've seen are certain local municipalities sort of partnering with other organizations to provide services to newcomers at free or, or low cost, like legal services and, you know, assistance with signing up with certain programs that are relevant to them that can be beneficial. And then also, I know um, I live in New York State, so um, New York is obviously a, a sanctuary state and they have the New York stands with asylum seekers. And so um, that is a program where they're collecting donations and, and um, different things that can be distributed to the folks who need them. And those are just sort of a couple of um, like on the ground level instances of support that, that I've seen. From based on our experience, you know, we have experience with um, several states, um, California and uh, Washington states, um, both have implemented um, uh, additional basic uh, programs targeting uh, refugees or parolees, you know, in the past um, uh, one and a half year. And so we've seen, you know, a few states do have specific programs um, to um, assist resettlement agencies in, you know, in housing. And then, um, and the, those programs I'm talking about are primarily rental assistance. Um, so providing additional rental, rental assistance to refugees. Um, and then there are also city and county governments that partner with um, IRC offices um, to help provide housing. So one example is um, um, a county in Washington um, state actually um, partner with um, our Seattle office. And then uh, so the Seattle office can use a, a county owned hotel um, actually at very low cost, basically almost free um, for um, temporary housing uh, for Afghan parolees. Um, and then another example is um, actually 
um, you know, I, I this is rare, but we did hear one office that was able to actually form a partnership with their pu public housing um, authority. Um, so one thing I want to mention is that there are actually many ways, city and state, um, municipalities, uh, counties, or um, states can um, really be part of the uh, resettlement housing effort. And but oftentimes that if there is no connection, um, you know, then the partnership is not going to happen. So um, it is very important to make connection with um, your state, um, city, county officials. Um, and, uh, you know, the, they may have um, resources that you may not know of. And when Sorry. you sit down in the meeting, then you may be able to get information and find out, you know, what the city, states and uh, states um, have to offer um, to help out with your resettlement housing effort. And, and just to piggyback on that, I think, you know, in terms of the importance of making connections, there's one affiliate in the highest network who through connections with, um, you know, local government was invited to apply for congressional earmarked funding to actually buy a building. Um, so again, thinking through some of those long-term solutions, that's, something that, um, you know, is not necessarily going to solve the problem tomorrow, but really important for the years to come and, and just finding out what kind of funding might be available so that your office can focus on some of those long-term solutions with the support of your local government. Awesome. Okay, great. Um, and the, the only thing I'll add to that is so at the Mark, state level- Mark, you over to Meg oh. for an initial review? Sorry, somebody was off mute. Um, yeah, the only thing I'll add to that is that at the state level, something, not all states, obviously, but several states um, have communication mechanisms. So a statewide call on a monthly basis where all the resettlement agencies can coordinate. Um, that's something that we've also seen uh, be very beneficial. But um, okay, great. Thanks, everyone. All right. So the next question, this is, uh, I think, the most upvoted in the Q&A section. Um, and no surprises, because we hear this all the time, but it's a great uh, question to really spend some time on, but um, how do we get around little or no background information, credit history, employment history, um, all the challenges that come with um, a newcomer re uh, refugee coming to the U.S. without all of the documentation required um, to traditionally um, have access to um, housing here in the U.S. So what are some strategies to get around that? Um, you know, what are ways that we can find other ways to document um, I'd really like it if you, you know, the three of you could kind of really unpack things that you've seen work uh, at the affiliate level, because this is, it's the most upvoted question. Um, and also it's something we hear all the time in, in um, technical assistance sessions, but how do we kind of bridge that gap with landlords and property owners um, to basically find ways to, to get access to housing without the traditional documentation that, that people would have? So I don't know if Chloe, you want to take that one? Sure. Um, I mean, I think one of the most important things for this is instead of going to those folks that are right in the leasing office, really getting in touch with folks that are at the property management company who have more authority to be able to make some of those concessions. Um, so again, I'm, you know, like a broken record, but really doing this in strength and numbers, I think is really important. Some of these property management companies are not just in your state, but are in states across the country. Um, so having a coordinated effort to approach those, those property management companies and really explain the benefits that um, could come to their company by having, you know, a steady stream of of uh, clients coming into their units, uh, an agency backing up, backing them up. So that's something that you can do um, with support of, of your national resettlement agency as well. I know that's something that we're all, all thinking about. Um, and I think another thing is really just providing education to landlords about your agency, um, your reputation and your community, um, you know, all the different support services that you provide um, and why, you know, not having these these documentations, um, you know, explaining when clients will receive that documentation, like social security and things like that, um, so that you know you can explain that refugees are the most vetted people that are coming to the United States, um, and hopefully have some flexibility there. 
Uh, one thing that we've been able to do as well is um, through our guarantee fund at HIAS, um, some of our offices will guarantee rent to landlords um, or co-sign on, on rent. But in this case of a guarantee, sometimes landlords are willing to um, you know, uh, waive some of those additional requirements because they know that the agency is backing it up um, and will be able to provide the, the rent no matter what. But I know it's, it's, it's a big challenge for us. Yeah, it's it's a big challenge for us too, Chloe. We also have a, a guarantee fund um, and have co-signing pilots a, across the nation as well. And we've also uh, developed other creative programs like our rent prepayment loans, which is funded through our uh, CDFI. And we're actually doing a webinar on that on Monday if anybody wants to attend. Um, but we will, um, yeah, so essentially with the rent prepayment, you're able to, uh, with collaboration with the client and some financial education, and support um, prepay the um, rent ahead of time for clients up to six months or so. And it just sort of depends on what the, the client needs in order to secure that permanent housing option. And um, it's a 0% loan. And so this is something that um, we're really excited about and, and are, have been using um, to, to great success. And also to echo what Chloe said, the landlord support letter. So just being able to have a letter, uh, it's a template that our offices can access and plug in information as needed that clearly so explains you know, our support, what we're providing the clients and um, this sort of just help the landlord better understand our clients, us, and um, um, really just sort of help work around some of those pre-existing requirements like credit and income history, those kinds of things. Um, sometimes talking to landlords and seeing if they're open to accepting alternative lines of credit, if that's an option. And um, just really highlighting also the importance of credit building programs and working with your local community um, to see what other services can be provided to clients because there are a lot of credit building programs out there. And so if you don't have a financial coaching team uh, in your office, this is something you can help refer clients to and get them that support so they can start building credit and, and transition easier into the U.S. Yeah, I think Chloe and Hannah covered pretty much all the strategies we've been all using um, in trying to, um, you know, educate and advocate, uh, educate landlord and advocate for our clients uh, so that um, we can help them um, secure housing. Um, and then um, both Chloe and Hannah mentioned, you know, co-signing, guaranteeing, um, and rent prepay um, that IRC uh, implemented and also has, um, has a very successful guarantee fund, um, I, I I think. Um, so, you know, all these are strategies um, to use um, to help um, convince landlord to work with um, resettlement agencies. Um, I would just add that um, in this particular area, we, we do need to be very, very creative. And there can be situation after you try everything, landlord still says no, um, particularly I think in situation when there uh, where there's a lot of competition in your area, you may have, landlord may have three applicants, you know, applying for one unit and then they will pick uh, the one with most, um, the best qualification in terms of you know, having income already and then also have good credit. Um, and so, you know, all the other strategy we use may still be not useful in this type of situation. So if your site um, does have competition, a lot of competition and there's just not enough units, um, I think you also need to kind of look into what are the other solution um, from the other side, really, you know, um, securing supply from a different um, way instead of just trying to convince landlords. Um, because if the competition is great, um, it's possible that um, a lot of the advocacy education or even the co-signing guaranteeing tool may not be effective. And so in that case, you should be also looking into other solutions. You know, what else could you do to increase your supply? Okay, great. And the next question actually uh, picks up where Chuni just left off. But the one thing I'll add is that this is really, and I echo everything that's been said, is that this is what's critical about maintaining relationships with landlords who do accept refugees. Um, because, you know, again, I think something that when uh, something happens to kind of burn a bridge with a refugee and a landlord, 
oftentimes that kind of severs the relationship and then they won't rent in the future. So if you have landlords that are willing to kind of look beyond the limited or non-existent documentation, really build those relationships and support that refugee and that landlord to maintain that relationship. So when that refugee moves out, that landlord understands and is willing to continue that, that partnership with the resettlement agency. Um, this is something that, you know, I know that there's, it takes a lot of energy to do that, but this is something we found as a common thing in resettlement agencies that are successfully resettling refugees is that they have landlords that they know they've worked with for years. Um, and so that documentation question is a much easier conversation to have um, when they already have been renting refugees and know that they're great clients. So um, yeah, great, great answers. Um, so the next one about, and this is a very difficult question, but it's something that often comes up. So um, this one is, I'll just read it from the chat. Are you aware of any large scale development projects being undertaken to address housing shortages, utilizing ARPA dollars or revitalizing or repurposing abandoned, abandoned or shuttered properties? Um, and they're looking for successes, best practices, and leveraging different kinds of um, uh, development communities, different types of stakeholders. So have you, are you, um, any of you familiar with uh, kind of new development or revitalization projects that are geared toward, um, you know, just that lack of housing in, in your work? Basically, you know, in general, the, the, the work in terms of developing or, or renovating existing building for um, affordable housing, this work never stopped. You know, it's, it's, it's an industry in the U.S. for, for a long time. For, and, and both Joshua and Hannah um, are very familiar with the affordable housing industry as well. Um, and, but the reality is the supply and demand, there is a mismatch. The demand is much greater than um, than the supply. And then the even though the building I, is, you know, has never stopped, but it's not catching up um, with the demand. Um, and that is the overall housing crisis that Joshua talked about in the beginning. Um, so you know, all these um, construction or renovation of, for affordable housing is happening across the nation. So definitely, I encourage everyone to, you know, um, to actually uh, look into affordable housing developers in your area and make connection with them uh, early um, to see whether there are any partnerships that you can form or any collaboration that um, you could develop, um, because it would be very useful. Um, maybe not immediately, but it could be very useful down the road. You know, again, this is maybe a mid midterm and long term planning. Um, oftentimes, you know, if the units haven't been developed, um, the developers are planning on it. They're, they're planning, you know, and it takes several years of planning. Um, and, you know, so that's why it's actually good to build a relationship early, because by the time they um, completed the development. And if there's a lot of public funding um, in the development, oftentimes there's a lot of restriction, you know, requirements in terms of eligibility, income, um, a lot of requirements they have to adhere to, you know, to the uh, public funder. Most of the time, it, the funding is probably, you know, through um, low income housing tax credit, or maybe some um, funding from Devop Department of um, <clears throat> Um, sorry, <laughs> housing and urban development, you know, HUD. And so since there are a lot of restrictions, um, oftentimes it may not completely work. Um, it is just depending on, you know, side by side, there, there could be a lot of differences. Um, but it, I definitely, you know, trying to build the connection early instead of waiting until that the uh, a development is already completed and already have wait list, um, then it would be too late for us to try to access um, those units. So I'll just chime in a little bit here. Um, so in terms of repurposing abandoned or shuttered properties for, for affordable housing purposes, there is a lot of very intricate and 
expensive things that go into affordable housing development, but also specifically turning around previously abandoned buildings and making them habitable again. And Josh, I know can speak a little bit more to, to what that's like. I'll try and make it really short, but so a lot of those efforts as, as great as they are, are have very specific challenges that, that can be really difficult to, to overcome. Um, and so that's why typically new development is sort of the, the preferred choice. I'm not saying that's the best choice, but it's typically the way a lot of developers tend to go. There are programs that turn around revitalized buildings, um, and you can look them up in, in your area to see what different affordable housing agencies may do this. But I know, for example, Habitat for Humanity does, does um, some repurposing of you know, uh, buildings to sort of transition them and, and give them a new life in, in the affordable housing sector. And so um, that's just something as an example to look into. And I know um, another example that's just recently come up that is a huge deal uh, for New Yorkers is NYCHA or the New York City Housing Authority is is um, going to be demolishing two of their largest buildings that are in Manhattan and, and rebuilding them. And um, they're going to be doing it at a coincided time. That way people can transition into the uh, new buildings and then the previous buildings will be demolished and it's going to provide a couple extra thousand units that that weren't previously there. And so those are the kinds of initiatives where we're kind of seeing that, but that is a huge undertaking. There's going to be a lot of um, kickback from it. I'm sure people are not going to be happy about buildings being demolished in Manhattan, um, but there, those are the kinds of things that, that are up against these sort of developers who have to um, think creatively and sort of bring on and take on the challenges of, of turning around uh, previously abandoned buildings into making them habitable. Yeah, thanks. And, I'll, you know, just a couple of things to add to that is, um, yeah, I mean, there's an affordable housing crisis in the US. It's not just specific to refugees and newcomers. So, you know, the way in which affordable housing is is being uh, created is part of the problem and the challenges in that. Um, but I do have two examples to the question about um, have states uh, launched two initiatives to deal with this. I only know of two, um, and we can follow up. Um, but there's one um, example in Nebraska in which they did some, they partnered with the affordable housing organization, I think it was Habitat for Humanity, and um, did do some new construction. So it, it is has been done. I think that, um, I don't want to get into how the funding structure was, because I don't want to, um, I'm not, don't know enough to speak to that. Uh, and then I also know there's a, um, a new initiative being launched in Michigan uh, by the state to, to address this. So there are some examples, but I bring those up not to say that um, that to say that across the U.S., you know, we've been doing this work for a while and we only know of two kind of single site examples means that it's really not going to be a long term solution to expect, um, you know, new construction to solve this issue. So I, I know that's a difficult thing, but just to kind of um, acknowledge that I don't think that the development of new that states developing new affordable housing is going to be a solution in the next you know six to 12 months so just for everyone to kind of um understand the reality around that unfortunately um yeah and if i can add you know just basically developments are long term um really you know it it's not something that that can really most of the time address our immediate needs um and uh, so that's and and just as hannah and josh mentioned the challenges um there development is not easy and affordable housing unfortunately it's not politically very popular um across the nation i would say <laughs> so that's why development is not easy even though it, it's never stopped it's just building you know 200 300 units here and there um you know all those units you know take years um and tears and sweats to to make it happen and and a lot of very complex funding so I, one thing i do want to mention is if you do want to make connection with affordable housing developers and see how you can partner um keep in mind that you know they do very difficult work right they are always looking for funding looking for support looking for a lot of different um uh, resources to make a project happen so you know think about in a win-win situation how your agency can um, partner what can you bring to the 
table to actually really um, make, you know, to help help make things happen, to help those units come true, you know, um, kind of think in their shoes a little bit on, on from their perspective. I think that's oftentimes, um, you know, it, it's easier to make connection and form positive relationships that can be beneficial over time. Okay, great. Thanks, Junie. Um, so quick, we'll get to the next question, but I just want to say I, I noticed some people, we have almost 300 participants, some people are raising their hands to ask questions. We're not able to do that with this many participants. However, um, if you have a question, just go right into the chat and put it in there. And I've seen the people who are raising their hands and I'll scroll down and hopefully we have enough time we can get to your question. So um, if you raise your hands, I, I appreciate your enthusiasm, but we don't have the, we can just put them in the chat and I'll I'll kind of address them to the to the panelists. Okay, great. Um, so along the lines of where we just kind of left off, and I'm glad uh, we're talking about the affordable housing organizations, but um, the next question is, uh, are there landlord boards or groups that can give us an opportunity to build relationships and share our needs on a broader platform as opposed to going kind of landlord to landlord? Um, so that, that's a great question um, about kind of creating a strategy, a communication strategy with landlords and property owners, but I'll hand that off to, to Chloe first. Thanks, Josh. Um, yeah, I mean, I think these are extremely localized, so it will take a little bit of research. Um, they definitely do exist in some locations, though, and one place to start might be with those landlords that you have hopefully long-lasting connections with to kind of get your foot in the door. Um, one thing that one of our sites did was actually holding a webinar for landlords um, and, you know, kind of phrasing the, the topic of, a, of the webinar in a way that would really cater to their interests rather than, you know, your interests as a, as a resettlement agency um, to provide uh, education and information about your agency and about the clients that you're resettling to a broad number of landlords overall, recording this, sending it out, using that as a tactic to be able to get to a larger number of landlords um, at once. Um, so I think that is, is one place to start, um, but definitely these exist. Um, they are just quite localized. I'm um, in hand. I'm not sure if you have a different experience than that. Yeah, I'm not sure of like a broad overarching board that that may exist of that. It, that's the same as my experience, Chloe, is that it is very uh, dependent on the locality. And um, so typically, and what I've done to, to engage landlords, is I've always checked with local community boards to see if they have an existing list or if there's an existing entity that, that landlords are meeting, maybe that landlords are having. The local community boards will typically have some kind of pulse on that. And then I've also, in my housing career, done endless housing housing fairs. <laughs> so just going, hosting a housing fair, inviting landlords, inviting property managers, inviting other housing entities, and just sort of collaborating in, in a neutral sort of community area and sharing about your program and your offerings and your clients. And that's a great way to meet other entities. And it's also a great way to meet landlords and, and property managers and, and be able to get your foot in the door kind of quickly, which I know there were, I think there was another question. It was like, how do you quickly develop a landlord relationship? Man, if I knew the answer to that, I think uh, things would be a lot of smoother, but it's unfortunately not a like one stop stop solution um, to that problem. But I think taking the time also to, to do something like that in a community event, and then also doing those one-on-one -on -one follow ups um, have been really helpful, typically in person. Um, they're, uh, notice landlords are typically more respons uh, responsive when it's in person rather than calling or sending emails. So um, having something like that could be really helpful too. So Chloe and Hannah have already talked about webinar and you know hosting um, housing fair. So I'll just add, yeah, I don't, I don't believe landlord board, you know, um, are are common um, in the U.S. However, there are realtors association and also apartment associations in your area. So I will actually think it's actually worthwhile to connect um, with your realtor association locally and also apartment association locally and and see whether you can you know get the opportunity to speak um, at their event. Um, both of them should have you know kind of regular membership event that realtors and apartments are attending. 
funding. Um, so if you can actually, you know, get in touch with uh, the associations and see whether you will be able to speak at one of their events, you know, to talk about uh, refugee resettlement and, um, you know, expect to, you know, it would be more of an education and advocacy um, effort. And I think that will be helpful too. Okay, great. Yeah. And just to add a couple of things to those, those are great answers. Um, the other thing that we've heard um, it, from resettlement agencies that have had some success, it's not going to be applicable everywhere, um, but that oftentimes when they engage with faith groups um, and they get in front of a lot of faith groups, you know, whether it be churches, mosques, or, you know, synagogues or wherever you're at, um, oftentimes there are a lot of um, kind of smaller landlords or property owners in those faith groups. And so, you know, doing some outreach to them for just kind of normal kind of community engagement, uh, support, um, but then also really putting it out there because um, this is something I know both, you know, from my work and then just um, anecdotally is that um, oftentimes that flexibility and who they're renting to through the faith groups, um, you'll find that there are, you know, property management or own property owners who are um, kind of much more open to being flexible when they, you know, know that they're, uh, there's a family and there's a resettlement agency behind them. So that's something to think about. So not necessarily landlords, but getting in front of kind of public groups and talking because there are uh, landlords in those groups. Um, another thing that we found um, positive is that there are in every state, um, unless I'm missing a couple, there are affordable housing conferences um, and that's a great networking. Um, you know, it might not necessarily be a direct connection to a landlord, but um, there are very robust affordable housing communities in most states. And um, a lot of that is mission alignment with resettlement agencies. So, you know, they would understand where you're coming from. Uh, and then also a secondary benefit to that networking. So not necessarily directly to landlord groups, but kind of involving those affordable housing organizations is that there are a lot of kind of what we call like wraparound services um, that could be beneficial to um, those families that you're supporting. So there might be some kind of secondary benefits there as well. So, but yeah, to Hannah's point, I mean, this is, this is what we're talking about. How do you engage with landlords, um, and do it, but, um, yeah, so great answers. Okay. Uh, our next question is, um, this is a good one. So kind of a little bit similar to where we're at now, but do you have any information on kind of credit building programs and specifically, uh, where does the guarantee fund come from? It's a two-part question. I can speak to credit building programs. Um, so specifically, look into your local HUD certified housing counselors. I know I've, I've already said this and I'm always plugging them because they've been invaluable resources to me in, in my career in housing. Um, there are a lot of credit building, financial education classes that are offered for free or at a very, very low cost um, that are all done by HUD certified counselors. They're trained and they're very well um, you know, informed on everything that they need to know and are really great resources. I've referred many clients to them over years and they have very thorough programs where they can, you know, pull a, uh, do a soft pull on the credit with the client and sort of talk about like, okay, these are the things that maybe need to improve on. And they have follow-up appointments and they're just very thorough um, and have a lot of high success rates in their program for people who follow through with it. And so um, definitely highly suggest looking into HUD and then seeing if there are any other financial uh, institutions in your area. Sometimes there will be programs through different financial entities or banks or financial advisors who offer pro bono services or low cost uh, services to people of certain income levels or certain, uh, you know, communities. And so definitely just do some light research and see what's possible. And I think I saw a question asking if HUD was specific to homeownership and it is not. They, they have a lot of resources for people who are looking for rental assistance or help with finding affordable homes or um, people who are going through um, hardship or need resources for, you know, accessing um, accessible homes, the ADA compliant homes as well. And so HUD has a ton of resources and I sound like a, a HUD, uh, like HUD's paying me, but they're not. Um, so that that's my contribution to that part. 
Yeah, and to just um, mention the guarantee fund. Um, so the, the funding comes from private highest funding in this case, um, private grants. So it's not um, US government funded. Um, so right now it is just available to highest affiliates, but I think something that could be useful to everyone, we will be soon kind of publishing um, and reporting out the default rate um, for refugees that have we have co-signed or guaranteed rent for, and they are extremely low default rates, um, which we're hoping can be used for everyone to, to show landlords the, the low risk associated with renting to, to refugee clients. Um, I will add a little bit to both uh, topics. Um, for credit building, um, IRC's Center for Economic Opportunity, um, we have the programming um, in most of the IRC offices and uh, um, the credit building service and slash financial coaching together because these two um, are hand in hand. So um, people have to be um, basically enrolled in financial coaching um, and to access uh, the credit building, uh, credit building loan service. And uh, um, that is actually available um, to um, clients who are not IRC, but basically will be enrolling in the financial capability service program. Um, so if you're interested in um, finding more about it, um, I encourage you to um, contact your, if there is a local IRC um, office at your location, um, to find out more about um, their financial capability service. Um, and then on the guarantee fund, similar to HIAS, we also, um, the IRC also basically fundraise. Um, so um, part of the guarantee fund is private funding. Okay, great. Yeah, um, yeah thanks so much. Those are great responses. Um, okay, uh, the next question, and this is something that got a significant amount of thumbs up. Um, another issue we've been dealing with is the expectations of arrivals uh, in their housing, referring to refugees. Uh, when we've been able to move them into an apartment immediately upon arrival, there have been dissatisfaction with their housing, um, and sometimes they're locked into a six to 12 month lease. How can we manage these expectations prior to or upon arrival? Um, so excellent question, um, something we hear very often, both on the, the temporary or short term housing and then especially in longer term housing. But um, maybe, Chloe, you want to kick us off with this one. So the dealing with expectations and what happens when you get locked into a lease and um, there's disappointment on, on the refugee end. Yeah, so a couple of things. I mean, I think one benefit that we've seen from these agency rented temporary units is that you know, transfers, out migrations, those kinds of things typically do happen usually within the first couple of weeks. Um, so having clients go into temporary, this is, you know, one of the perks of, of actually having temporary housing before permanent housing is that if clients are going into an agency rented unit um, and then end up transferring or out migrating, um, it doesn't ruin the relationship with the landlord there because it's just being um, subleased from the agency. Um, but in terms of expectations, um, you know, this is something that we we talk a lot about, and I think really a great place to start is is just cultural or orientation and education. So I think something that is kind of new to resettlement is having to explain to clients the housing crisis, right? This is not something that's always been a reality um, for us here in the US and really explaining now the situation and why it's so difficult, why it's not possible to move units, all of the work that your staff have been doing just to find this one unit, um, explaining the different requirements for securing housing in the US, I think is something that sometimes we overlook and forget to explain to our clients. So explaining the limitations of not having credit, social securities upon arrival, an employment history, a leasing history. Um, that's not something that clients are necessarily going to know upon arrival. And it does take, you know, some explanation. Um, we, I was just recently speaking with some overseas cultural orientation providers who were explaining that, you know, depending on where someone is coming from, it might be a much more kind of lax um, system in terms of securing housing in the country that they are from or you know, a temporary country where they were living. So really explaining the restrictions that we're working around, I think is a good place to start. 
Um, we also always talk about having consistency and messaging from your staff. So making sure that one case manager and one manager are all giving the same responses to clients um, to make sure that that you know doesn't present uh, different issues for you if they can get you know a better answer from someone else on your team. Um, and I think also just acknowledging the again the the mental health and also um, you know greater meaning that housing might mean to particular clients, right? So it's. It's not necessarily that clients are wanting to be difficult. It's just that this is maybe presenting um, some sort of past trauma that's coming up based on a housing situation, knowing that um, displacement and the lack of housing in many instances is the reason for their refugee status. Um, so I think just kind of approaching that with, with a culturally competent response is also really important. Um, I, I could go on, but I want to have my, the other panelists um, uh, have an opportunity to, to answer this one as well. Thanks. That was great, Chloe. Uh, yeah, you really highlighted all of the, the important factors there. So yeah, uh, just to add on, you know, housing is so emotional and there are so many feelings and thoughts and you're moving and all this information is being thrown at you, you know, it is really important to be patient and, you know, um, try and be very clear in your communication and your messaging and provide clients and uh, newcomers all of the tools that they need in order to wrap their minds around our very intense housing market, um, which is so intense and just unlike really anything. And so um, some tools that we use to help with the expectations, uh, we, we use a lot of RHS's materials. They have a lot of great materials on housing. Uh, we use uh, CORE or the Cultural Orientation Resource Exchange, who has a really great um, housing orientation and lease orientation. And it's offered in various languages. Um, you can use Settle In. They're really great resource also through core um, that's an app that can kind of like guide clients through multiple languages again um, through the housing process and um, there's a video as well called housing in the U.S. and it just sort of helps set that standard and expectation of you know these are the challenges that we're facing in the market and um, just sort of setting up the stage for what their anticipated housing can be like. And um, yeah, just again, those clear communications from the beginning and just really reiterating that this also doesn't have to be their forever home, that um, you know they can work with a financial coach or a HUD counselor to help build a budget and a plan for eventually moving out if that is a goal of theirs. But really, this is just a um, safe, stable place for them to sort of reintegrate or integrate into the U.S. and uh, yeah, I think just really highlighting that and having some coaching around that can sort of help conceptualize it. Um, but it is, a, it is a challenge. We definitely acknowledge that as something all of our offices have expressed as a difficulty. So, Yeah, um, Chloe and Hannah, I think, cover everything. I would just add that um, in, in some more, you know, difficult situations or conversations, um, a few tips that we learned from our offices that they found useful is one is, you know, like actually um, engaging in, cli in clients, you know, let clients kind of participate in the search, you know, when housing specialists are, are looking for housing online, you know, um, maybe sitting down with clients looking at the, um, the, options together, you know, um, because then, you know, clients see the first hand, right, you know, the prices and, um, you know, what, what type of units are available, you know, within certain price range. And then the other thing, the other uh, tip we have for, you know, more, um, if it's, you know, kind of more difficult and really high expectation is also to kind of work with clients on their family budget um, to really sit down to do the budget and 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 it help um, client understand um, you know their budget you know the direct assistance um, the funding available for housing and the the limitation um, um, on the first housing um, and it's these, of course, in your not the conversation, these are not easy. They're definitely, just like um, Hannah mentioned already, housing is emotional, and clients went through trauma and loss. So none of 
uh, none of these are going to be easy conversations. Um, but, um, you know, if you approach in a um, empathetic and very supportive manner and, you know, helping client understand and helping educate client and maybe turn the opportunity into also talking about, about second housing, you know, building um, their um you know, kind of improving their financial capability over time so that the second housing, they will have more options. Um, so it would be, it, it can actually be an opportunity for additional education um, so that clients can understand housing in the US and what it takes um, to kind of continue to improve their housing situations. Yeah, thank you so much. All, all three excellent um, responses. Uh, the only thing that I'll add is that one thing that we have developed, and there'll be links at the end of this webinar, and we're going to send out, we can send out a follow-up email after this with links to what I'm going to say now, is that um, because that communication strategy around expectation settings is so critical, um, and, you know, consistency is really important in this, and also, you know, mo uh, very often uh, refugees and newcomers are not necessarily um, comfortable with English, is to really set up a checklist, um, and we have templates for this, of just kind of expectation setting. So, um, you know, here, he, just kind of making sure that you are setting some time aside to really talk about those things that oftentimes we assume people uh, are familiar with. Um, so everything from, you know, Hannah, and it was mentioned a couple of times about, you know, this is the beginning of your kind of pathway of housing in the U.S. and really talking about some of those milestones uh, and really encouraging people to see the context in which that first unit um, that they're moving into. Often, um, we also hear often that there's expectations about, you know, uh, refugees being dissatisfied with the quality of housing. Um, and again, you know, I think to, to Chuni's point, just that including that family or that individual into that search so that they're not kind of surprised when they get to the unit, um, but they kind of understand what the process is, what the challenges are, um, and to really create a system around documenting that and communicating that. Because oftentimes we found that a lot of assumptions uh, lead to problems um, later on. So great answers. Okay, um, our next question, and we're getting close to the end, so maybe this is our second to last question, but um, I think it's a very important one, um, and it's about accessing housing for clients with disabilities. Um, so, you know, there there's a lot of different um, people that come to resettlement agencies uh, for support for the refugee or, you know, different newcomer programs, but um, how do we address disabilities and people who um, require different kinds of housing, and what are some strategies around that? And I don't, I don't know if uh, Chloe, you want to jump in or if anybody wants to start. Go ahead, Chloe. <laughs> Did you want to go? I was just going to say that um, typically there are some requirements from landlords to provide reasonable accommodation. And so the first step is to always talk to the landlord and see what they're willing to do um, and what they're able to do. And then there are also, um, depending on your area or maybe your state may have a resource um, for a local ADA chapter that can sort of help provide insight to um, other Maybe there will be, like, um, I've seen before, like donations where you can receive some donated items or there's like funds that clients can apply for to help um, transform their homes maybe into something that's a little bit more ADA compliant. Um, and so first, I'll just, if they're just talk to the landlord and then see maybe what state or local um, ADA organizations are available that can sort of help you in your specific needs. Yeah, and I would just add, I, I mean, I think this can be particularly challenging when we have limited health information before arrival. So speaking with your national agency to try to learn absolutely as much as you can about the client situation. Um, sometimes those SMC forms are hard to read. Um, so making sure that we, we at least are gathering as much information we can about the disability um, before arrival. Um, in some situations, what we've done uh, when it's you know very hard to secure um, uh, you know 
uh, appropriate housing just from our pool of landlords is go to um, our community, to our groups of volunteers to see if anyone has um, ADA compliant housing available. It's never normally our first option to do kind of home hosts and things like that, but that has been a solution in, in some instances. Um, especially if we don't have complete information about what exactly will be needed in the unit before arrival. Um, but again, I would also, you know, as you're doing your, you know, if you've housing coordinators just doing your search uh, for other clients, when you do come across ADA compliant housing, making sure to make note of it, keep up those relationships, because as, as you all know, these cases can, um, you know, arrive in your pipeline and it's really good to be having um uh, you know a good relationship with those with those housing opportunities I think both Chloe and Hannah have already talked about you know kind of the housing options and and building connection to um get you know more ADA compliant um housing so I'll I'll speak more to you know kind of rental assistance uh, because we do know that um Oftentimes, clients um, who have disabilities may need longer term rental assistance. So I would say to work on that too, be prepared, you know, make connections with community resources that can provide additional um, assistance in this area. Um, and, uh, you know, do you have um, intensive um, case management programming, you know, or PC, uh, preferred community programming in your, um, in your, in your site, or if not in your agency, other agencies that may have these programs that can actually assist, uh, assist um, people, you know, longer term with rental assistance. So I think that's another aspect um, related to um, people with disabilities that you need to look into and, and be, be prepared for it. Okay, great. Um, and thanks. Great answers. Uh, the only thing I'll add is that this is something that we did. There are a, oftentimes case managers don't necessarily have like a, a kind of housing background specific to the types of things that are required for um, ADA kind of compliant units. So one thing is that uh, this is very easily uh, found online is that there are checklists, walkthrough checklists um, to make sure that units are ADA compliant. So if you have um, a refugee or a client that you're working with that has disabilities, um, I would really encourage you to, you know, find one of those ADA checklists and walk through because oftentimes they're not compliant. Um, and just oftentimes case managers don't necessarily know about things like, you know, um, door widths and things that are a little bit more technical. So, um, you know, don't think that you have to know everything about ADA to know if a unit is accessible. So just something to keep in mind as a resource. Okay, great. So we're almost at, this is the last question, um, and then we'll wrap it up. But, um, and then this is a good question to end on because it's a very kind of organizational focused question. But um, how, so the question is, how do you divide responsibility in regard to housing between housing coordinators, case managers, resettlement managers, and resettlement directors? So kind of each of those tiers in the organizational structure uh, of a, of a, you know, a kind of an office level, how do you divide those responsibilities and what would be an approach that you would kind of recommend to kind of leadership or, you know, um, a, a director at an affiliate? Um, what are some strategies that you think would be a, a helpful to assist in, in addressing these housing challenges? Yeah, this is a great question. I think um, it's, it's something that a lot of folks are thinking about since housing coordinator, housing specialist positions are somewhat new. Um, so I don't think there's one right answer here. I think there's a lot of different great approaches, um, but I think one thing that leadership should really think through is when a housing coordinator position exists, it sometimes can lead to all housing responsibilities landing on this person. Um, so I, and what I mean by that is, you know, you know, even though securing housing might be the most difficult thing, there are a lot of housing issues and services that come up throughout the RMP period. So um, help with, you know, um, things that are broken in an apartment, like communicating with landlords, paying rent, um, just continued cultural orientation on, you know, being a good tenant. And I think the question there is what should be the responsibility of the housing coordinator and what should be the responsibility of the case manager or just the clients themselves. 
Um, again, I don't think there's one right answer here, but if your goal is really to have someone full-time working on securing housing and developing landlord relationships, those smaller things can sometimes take away the time uh, that the housing coordinator needs to be focusing on those larger picture things. So I think what we've seen is that sometimes it's tempting to have that person doing everything housing related, but we sometimes need to draw those boundaries of case managers still working directly with clients on ongoing housing needs and having housing coordinators really focusing on larger picture of developing uh, relationships with landlords. Um, I do also think that housing really needs to be a whole office approach um, everybody hands on deck, you know, having their ears open for any uh, potential um, connections with with landlords in the community or or through other resources. Um, so yeah, I think really uh, an all hands on deck approach, but having clear expectations for everyone is is what works the best. Yeah, and I will share. I'm definitely I'm a proponent of having more than one housing <laughs> staff in 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 sites and the IRC actually in most of our sites um does have you know each site has more than one housing person um of course you know that you need to um, assess that based on the arrival numbers and the you know um, the budget and all that so you know if, even though I say I'm a proponent, but of course, you know, you need to assess that based on your organization's situation. Um, and I echo what Chloe, Chloe mentioned, um, because, you know, it, it, there is a tendency of if particularly if, if there's only one housing staff, you know, everything housing related lands on, on that person. But housing search, you know, building relationship, building partnership, or maybe even advocacy, you know, joining the, your local coalition for affordable housing to advocate for, you know, changes in your local area. That's actually each of them is a, a job in itself. Um, so definitely, you know, acknowledge it acknowledge that reality and then build that into your um, capacity planning and uh, keep it very clear um, who is responsible for what, um, setting boundaries um, so that it's very clear for your case workers, case managers, and clear to the housing specialists what each of them are responsible for. Um, if possible, yeah, definitely, you know, if you can get more than one housing person um, and then, you know, um, and for I can the IRC example is like basically actually they are structured very different from office to office. Um, some offices actually divide the um, housing specialist re responsibility into short term and long term. Like say one person handle um, kind of the RMP the first ninety days, and then the next person the the other person handle more like you know, anything beyond 90 days, you know, continue kind of assisting clients with rental assistance or additional housing education or counseling help. Um, but there are also um, offices that divided based on, you know, one person handle all the temporary housing arrangement and partnership building and the other person handle, you know, permanent housing. Um, and just like Koi said, there's no, you know, you you kind of have to tailor that based on your um, local situation because it also tied to your housing market and housing is very local. So every market is different. And among IRC sites, we have urban sites, rural sites that we're talking about very different, you know, environment. So offices have to actually take that into consideration too in their, you know, kind of um, dividing the responsibilities. And uh, finally, I also echo Chloe's um, whole office approach. Housing is a whole office approach because housing touches on everything. Housing is a particular area that it, it doesn't really, it, it Everybody working housing have to work, you know, also on, you know, many other things, health related, social work, you know, um, finance, you know, we talk about credit building and all that. Housing has all these different aspects. That's why it does need a team approach, um, you know, to really improve um, housing services. And I'll just quickly add, I know we're close to time. Um, everything that Chuni and Chloe says absolutely agree with. And sometimes the best way to sort of clearly delineate all the hats that we wear and all of our pieces and parts of our work is to just get everyone in a room and sit down and map it out and just say from point A to point Z, 
here's the process. These are the things that need to happen in here, the roles that are responsible for that. And that takes, that's something that takes a little bit of time, but again, is going to make things easier and more streamlined moving forward. And so um, I know many of our offices are doing that approach. I've done it in previous housing roles. It's really important when you have maybe one person or two people who just have so many different duties that are impacted by other people doing their jobs and doing them on time and just having all of that laid out from start to finish is very, very helpful and a point of reference for the whole office. So definitely something that we uh, recommend, we, we refer to it as having a housing strategy. I think Jenny mentioned it earlier. So um, yeah, that's that's definitely something we recommend. Okay, excellent. Um, and that's a great place to end for today. Um, I just want to thank our panelists, uh, Chloe Chuni and Hannah. Thanks so much. This was excellent. I know it was very much appreciated. Um, so that's it. We'll wrap it up. A couple of kind of final slides, a couple of successful housing strategies, collaborative partnerships, community stakeholder engagement, learning best practices of affordable housing organizations, and partnering with local uh, affordable housing organizations. Um, our learning objectives where we started describe ways in which the U.S. housing crisis affects newcomers, including through rental housing shortages and rising costs. And the idea of today was to name um, uh, promising practices from the field to help navigate these challenging market conditions. So we hope that that was what we accomplished. Um, we can uh, we can we can skip this last one because we're kind of out of time. Um, there are a couple of links embedded in here. Um, we really encourage you uh, to go and and look through. Um, these here. The other thing I wanted to add um, is that we have uh, both with Switchboard, our partnership, um, there's a great, there's a tremendous amount of resources that are already there. Um, encourage you to go to that website and then also uh, Refugee Housing Solutions. Okay, so that's it for today. Uh, we do have a survey. If uh, those of you who are still on the call, um, if you would be willing to, to fill this out, we can drop the link in the chat as well. Um, we really appreciate your feedback, um, and we do read all of the comments, and we do use them to improve uh, our webinars uh, in the future, so we really appreciate that. Um, and um, we'll leave it on the last slide uh, with some links to both Switchboard for Technical Assistance, which is something we provide in partnership um, with IRC Switchboard, um, so feel free to go there if you need any support, um, and that's it. Thanks so much, everybody. And um, we really appreciate the time that everyone took to support today and uh, we'll leave it there. Okay, thanks so much. Bye. Thanks everyone. Thanks everyone, bye. Yeah.